Do you often look at code that you wrote six months ago and then scratch your head wondering what mess you have created? If so, then this video is for you. In today's video, I'm going to show you four ways in which you can improve the documentation and the code to understand what is actually happening with it. Hey friends, I'm Andy, and if you already knew that, then welcome back to the channel. Imagine this situation. You sit down and begin writing some code to solve a problem that you've been assigned. You eventually complete the code and it all works and gives you the answers you need. You save the code file and then forget about it. Six months later, you're assigned a new task and realize that you've done something similar, but not quite the same. So you dig out your old code and attempt to run it, only to be confronted with errors. You then start looking at the code and after a few minutes, you realize you have no clue what part of the code is doing what and why. And fixing this issue could take you hours. I'm sure many of us have been in that same situation at some point within our career. In order to get the code working, we end up spending more time trying to fix it and trying to understand what actually is happening within the code rather than actually applying the code to our problem and trying to reach a solution. When I started Python coding about four or five years ago, I too was in a similar situation where I wrote some code and then came back to it several months later to find out that I couldn't understand why I actually wrote it the way I did. So since then, I have been learning about how to properly document my code using a mixture of comments, documentation strings, naming variables appropriately. That has been a big help to improve the way that I write code, and when I come back to that code, it is much easier to understand. And I am sure many of us within the geoscience community can relate to this, especially if we don't have a computer science background. So there are a number of ways that we can reduce the time that it takes us to become familiar with our code again, and that is what I'm going to show you in today's video. So we're going to cover comments, documentation strings, type hinting, and properly naming variables. So I will cover each of these very briefly just to give you an indication of how we can use them to improve our code. First up, we have comments. When we read the code, we get an understanding of what it is actually doing based on the logic used. However, we do not understand the why or more detail about what we're actually doing within certain sections. And comments are a great way to help the reader understand the reasoning behind using certain pieces of code. When adding comments, you want to make sure that you're not overdoing it. And the comments should be there to explain the code, not detailing step by step what each line is actually doing. So let's have a closer look at our code example and see how we can improve it with some comments. Comments within Python are usually created by using the hashtag symbol, like so. And then we enter some text to explain what is happening within the code. Now in my Visual Studio code, you can see that they appear in, in grey. However, it may appear differently in your IDE or Visual Studio code, and that will depend upon the theme that you are using. So in our code example here, we're going to work through it and improve it. And we can see that we do not have any comments at all explaining what is happening within the code. So let's begin adding some to our code. Within this first function here, load last file, we have this section of code that checks for a start depth. And if it is not none, or it's going to set the new data frame, called D in this case, to start from an index that is greater than that value. However, if you're reading this code, you may not understand why we want to do this. So we can easily add in a comment just to explain why we want to do this piece of code. In this case, we just want to say, start the data frame at the entered start depth value. And this just allows us to have a smaller data frame that focuses on the area of interest. Then we have the second function, clay volume. Now we've got a bit of a code here that is doing a calculation and then creating a result which has taken the previous value and multiplying it by 0.6 in this case. And then we have this FLF statement down here. Now this may be a little bit confusing but in this case what we're wanting to do is limit the results between 0 and 1. So you would not have anything less than 0% clay and you would not have anything more than 100% clay which is represented by 1 in this case. So we just want to add a little bit of clarity to this piece of code and we can do that by adding another comment and we can say that we are limiting clay volume, the result, to between 0 and 1. So right away we can see why we're running this piece of code. And then finally in this last section where we're checking if we've got the if we're running this file directly with this if statement for if name is equal to main and then we are loading the last file printing the header out and then doing the calculation and printing out the header after that 
So perhaps we just want to add a few comments in here just to say checking if uh, data has been loaded successfully. So we just want to see the header of that data and then we can tell whether that data has been loaded correctly. And then we may have multiple steps within our code. So this could be perhaps step one. Step one, which is calculate clay volume. And then we may have multiple steps. So we may have step two, which is calculating the porosity. Step three, which is calculating the water saturation. So we ha may have these multiple steps and it just helps guide the user through the workflow. Python is a dynamically typed language which means that the variable types such as string, float and integer will only be checked at runtime. And these data types can change during the execution of the code. For instance, we may go from an integer to a float and maybe changing it to a string if we're calling it somewhere else down in the code. For some languages like C Sharp, we have to declare the data type up front when we're declaring the variable. In Python 3.5, they introduced type hinting and this allows us to hint at what type a variable can be. And this can benefit us as we know what data type a function will require, whether it be a string or an integer. Not only that, it can help improve the readability of our code and reduce any ambiguity. So let's have a look at our two functions and see how we can implement type hinting. So looking back at our two functions here for loading a last file and carrying out a clay volume, if we look at the first function, we can see that we have two parameters within the definition of this function. We have a parameter for a file name and then a parameter for the start depth. And you can see that the start depth is set to none. So if no value is passed in, and this parameter will be set to none when this function is called. When we look at this function, we do not know what type the parameters are requiring. For example, start depth could be an integer or a string. By using type hinting, we can say that the file name is supposed to be a string, and we can do that by typing in a colon followed by str, and that represents a string. And then we have start depth, which can be a decimal value, so therefore we require a floating point. To do that with a keyword parameter, we can put this colon in before the equal sign, and we will set that to float. So now, when we hover over this function, we can see that the file name that it's requiring is going to be in a string, and then the start depth is going to be a float. So we know right away what we're actually going to pass in. So not only can you define or type hint the inputs to a function, you can also type hint the return value. In this case, we are returning a data frame. And we can set up a type hint for the return value by doing a dash followed by a right angled chevron. And then we're going to return a data frame, so it's pd.data frame. And you'll notice right away that we've got pd with a squiggle, which indicates that this library has not been imported. It is not defined. So we can go up to the top here, import pandas as pd, and that resolves that issue. Now if we go down to our second function, our clay volume, we can see that we've got three parameters here. We've got gamma ray, gr shale, and gr clean. For each of these values, we're going to give them a type hint of float, as we may want to pass in decimal value to each of these parameters. And we're also returning back a float. So right away, we can see when we look at these functions, we've got more information about what they actually require. Before we get on to the next section, if you're enjoying this content and you want to see more like this, then please click on that subscribe button down below and also hit that thumbs up button as well. It helps the channel out immensely. When writing functions within Python, it is often helpful to understand what that function is as well as what the expected parameters are. And these are called documentation strings or doc strings for short. And these are easily created and can explain a lot about a function. And these doc strings can then be used to build up a documentation for your Python library or code. So let's look at our code and see how we can add some doc strings to our functions. So within Visual Studio Code, we can use a number of extensions to help us speed up the process of coding and typing in some of the, the doc strings. In this case here, I'm using auto doc string, which you can get on the extensions section of Visual Studio Code, and it just helps speed up that process. And as you can see here from the example, and it creates a basic template for you to fill in. If we go back to our code, we can see that we've got these two functions here again. So if I go to this function here called load last file, 
and then type in uh, three double quotes, we can see that we get this generate doc string section. So if I press enter on this, we automatically create this little bit of commented code. And here we can see that we've got a summary and you can see it's highlighted in gray, which means I can tab through each of these. So using tab to go forward and shift tab to go back. And so in this case, we just want to expand on some of these placeholders. So for the summary, and we'll say read a last file and generate a data frame. You'll see as well that with the file name, we've got str already picked up and also the fault for the start depth. And this is just picked up from the type hinting that we did in the previous section. So it's always recommended to do your type hinting first before you go on to doing the doc string as it will populate these fields for you. So for the description of file name, we can say name of the last file to be loaded. And for the start depth, and you can see that we've got by default none, and it is also optional. So the user will know right away that when they are coming to use this function, they don't have to pass a start depth, but they can if they want to. We'll add the description saying that is the depth to start the data frame from. So the last file may be starting from a much shallower uh, interval or a much shallower depth. So we just want to pass in the start depth that we want to start this data frame from. Then we go down to the return section and then we've got the description as well and we can just say returns a pandas data frame of all data from the last file and that's pretty much it. So one of the big benefits of having these doc strings is that you can go down to where you're calling this function, for example load last file, and you if you hover over that function call you get this pop up here that details what the function is actually needing and what it is actually doing. So we can see, read a last file and generate a data frame, and then we've got the parameter section, and then we've got the return section. So this is very helpful if you're actually going to call this function. So if I call upon load underscore last file, and when I put in the, the open brackets, we can see what we're going to start passing in. So at the moment it's requiring a file name and you can see that that is highlighted by bold text. So if I type in file name dot LAS followed by a comment, we can then see we're moving on to the start depth. So we don't have to specify this, but we can do if we want. Doc strings are also useful when we're creating the actual documentation of our code using something like Sphinx. So if we want to load that onto read the docs, for example, this is where the doc strings can be very handy as they can be automatically extracted from the code. Sometimes when writing code, we want to write it as quickly as possible and we don't have the time to come up with fancy names for some of our variables and we end up calling some variables x, y, i, j, and then when we revisit that code, we have no idea what those variables are. So it's best practice to actually try to come up with a name for those variables at that point, as it allows us to understand what that variable is. So within our code, we actually have a few of these single letter variables within the first function. So let's have a look and see what we can do to rename them. If we look at some of these functions, we can see that we've got single letters for some of our variables, f, d, d, return d. So these are not very descriptive and not very helpful knowing what each of these represents. So we could expand these a little bit. So for example, if I re rename this F variable, we can highlight that F and then press in, on my keyboard function in F2 or F2 if your, your function keys are set up that way. So instead of F, I'm going to change this to last file. And then when I hit enter, it automatically renames the other instances of this. So now we've got last file.df instead of just an F. And we can repeat the same with the D. We can see that we've got multiple instances and we could rename them manually, but it is much more helpful to just do a bulk rename on all of these. So if you do not have this functionality within your code editor, you can also do a search and replace uh, within say a text editor or Notepad++. And we'll just rename this to data frame. And we can see that all instances of the letter D within this particular function have been renamed to data frame. And this just makes it much more readable when we're looking at this. And we can also apply this to function names. So in this instance here, we've got clay volume. We may have different functions that we want to call clay volume. So one may be actually getting an actual value. We may have a clay volume for uh, specific methods. 
So for this instance, we're just using a linear method for this. So if I just do uh, a rename on this, we can see that we've got the same window that pops up to rename. And we've also got another instance of this down here where we're actually calling it. So in this case, I'm changing the ending of this and call this linear. And we can see down below that we've also got that updated. So we may have a, another clay volume calculation for Larianov or Stiber, depending on which equation you want to implement. And there we have it, we've covered four separate tips on how to enhance your code through documentation using comments, doc strings, explicit typing, and also naming your variables appropriately. If you've enjoyed today's video, be sure to give it a thumbs up. And if you want to see more content from this channel, be sure to click on that subscribe button and ding that notification bell. So until next time, thanks for watching and bye for now.